the importance of mergers and acquisitions in the telecom sector is well known. Particularly in future packet networks, it gets very important to understand it in full. So in this module, we'll understand the need, the key factors, the forces which determine such merger and acquisition to realize consequent concerns. And then we'd also look at some key terms which are important to be understood. Mergers and acquisitions are essential in telecom sector because the telecom market is very difficult to realize. It has high fixed costs. Later, it has low marginal costs but the initial deployment or the capex requirements are very high. This encourages the corporates to do consolidation. Consolidation, as we shall see, is a type of a merger or acquisition in which the two parties come in a certain contractual obligation. In 1990s, the US and Europe started interacting and reaching out to each other, and this saw an immense wave of mergers and acquisitions. Consequent to the mergers and acquisitions, there's a reconfiguration of the entire market structure world over. What happens is, with mergers, there is a limited pool of service providers which remains out there. This results in kind of monopolization, or we say oligopolizing, of the telecom industry. The obvious reason for merging is a business concern, that is profitability. So we say that telecom giants merge or acquire each other either for efficiency or for product or market diversity. Their mergers could vary in terms of the speed which takes place in merging the two giants or the size of the merger depends on the size of the two stakeholders. There are certain side issues and factors which equally determine the motivation for merging. That is, there are some over-ambitious individual proprietors which have very high ambitions. Similarly, at times, it's a requirement, particularly for companies which are listed in the stock exchange, to avoid the risk of bankruptcy. Then the timing of buying out a company or merging into a company is very important with regards to the high and low of the recession and the vibrant market environment. For instance, when there's, a, when there's a golden opportunity for the first entrant, he or that particular uh, proprietor is expecting the largest profit out of selling itself off or buying another sister concern. The factors are many, but we are going to touch upon the essential ones, which in turn create other sub-factors. The first and obvious one is globalization. When we say globalization, it means transcontinental and transnational activity, which is business deals. This results into a lot of business requirements, which allows the companies from different countries to synergize and to have a symbiotic relationship with each other. Add to this the liberal or the neoliberal requirement of the foreign companies to invest in a telecom sector to have value addition, not only in their own country, but across the globe. Then the next factor which has a very important role is the deregulation environment. The regulatory landscape in 1996 was the turning point or the watershed moment that dictated the post-monopolistic environment. Before that, companies such as AT&T were enjoying the regulatory leverages which were given by the US government. But as per 1996 Telecom Act, the deregulation took place and the companies 
were allowed to compete in the open market. Of course, this result in, it resulted into antitrust and the uh, consumer protection related issues and consequently the uh, consumer protection laws and uh, antitrust laws were also incorporated in due course of time. And then there are some technological advancements which actually dictate a certain merger or an acquisition to take place. For instance, as we know in NGN, we talk about network convergence, service convergence, operator convergence. In all, we can call it digital convergence. So sometimes the conglomerates have to provide more than one service if they really want to survive and stay in the market. This comes at the cost of increasing the features in their hardware and software. For that, they need to join hands with their perhaps rivals as well. Then the next factor is the economies of scale. The economies of scale actually means that the industry goes through certain vulnerable periods because of the uh, global or international uh, socio-political and economic uh, conditions. So this allows the companies to reach out to other companies to expand their marketplace and reduce the risks by joining hands with their own competitors. This helps them to survive the worst period of recession and slow growth. And to their advantage, now they have a new market and new customer base that they can access just by virtue of having economies of scale by joining hands with their competitors. Then we have the economies of scope. That means sometimes having a certain media type and marketing it and selling it and thriving on that is not sufficient. So at times there's a requirement to reduce the dependence on certain media type and extend the product line. This helps the organizations to survive by reaching to other organizations for an outward growth for not only the current market, but also a new market where their products, their fresh line of products could be potentially sold. Last but not the least, America being one of the pioneering countries um, in, in the telecommunication sector has devised a very interesting tax environment that encourages giants and uh, uh, behemoth, behemoths, if you may. They allow the large sized companies by incentivizing them to expand. So it means a giant could turn into a mammoth or a behemoth, if you may. And they do it in such a smart way because they have ways to manipulate tax by asking their tax consultancy firms to include the price of the media company that they acquire to show it as a tax liability. This is encouraging for the large scale companies, but this discourages the startups and uh, uh, smart, modern, small scale um, on, uh, enterprises to, to compete with these giants because the effective purchase price for these giants during the merging and acquisition process is shown to be relatively heavy and burdensome. So American tax environment knows that they have a customer base and the US government wouldn't like their business processes to stall. That is why they give special favor to these giants. This results into a new market place where certain dynamics come into play. For instance, on the positive side, a diverse range of telecom services could now be offered and large swaths of earth would now be provisioned with such services. So it means the diversity and coverage have 
both increased. This, however, is coming at the preferential um, treatment of profitability for these organizations, which actually mars or weakens the state mandated concerns. So it means for a nation state like Pakistan, India, Australia, or anywhere else in the world, giants coming from United States are going to have impact which our governments would not be able to sustain. In addition, the provisionism desire, that is everyone has to have access to the, to the digital services is compromised because the merger activity identifies or accentuates the inequality in the telecom sector. It means somebody who is the primary customer of these giants as a consequence to mergers and acquisitions is going to benefit more in terms of better quality as compared to developing nations like Pakistan or uh, Bangladesh and the like. Now, let's look at certain uh, key terminologies. These are uh, mere definitions, but with regards to the overall um, concept of how the networks have evolved, merged, been acquired over time, uh, some formal understanding uh, is necessary. So we'll start off with the very definition of merger as such. What's merger? Merger is basically an agreement between two companies to consolidate their functions as well as assets. So these two companies decide to work as one united company. This is straightforward merger, which is based on parity. Acquisition is when a large fish swallows a small fish. One company purchases other company and its assets. Then the concept of acquired company is it's the target company, which is purchased by another buyer company, which is the acquiring company. Then we have different kinds of acquisitions, per force acquisition, which is hostile acquisition and friendly acquisition. Friendly acquisition is when a target company and its board of directors and shareholders willfully allow their company to be a target company and be sold to an acquiring company. The hostile acquisition is where uh, the acquiring company makes direct offer to the shareholders without deference and consultation with the board of directors. It's also known as the tender offer. Then there is a very interesting concept, conglomerate. Uh, this is uh, a profound phenomenon in, uh, in Europe, in Japan, and in South Korea. Uh, in South Korea, it is known as Chebel, uh, that is a giant. So conglomeration is basically a merger between medium-sized to small-sized companies, which are completely unrelated in their um, marketplace, whether it's their products or their services. So a conglomerate is a very large company that comes into existence when small group of companies come together. Then we have the leveraged buyout. Leveraged buyout is basically um, a, a luxury or a leverage to an acquiring company that somehow manages to get a lot of loan from somewhere, gets enough exchequer to buy the target company. Then we have a, a statutory murder, a merger versus statutory consolidation. Uh, a statutory merger is when one of the merging companies uh, uh, decides to remain as an individual legal entity, although uh, it's been merged into the acquiring company, but still its identity is somehow preserved. Consolidation is when uh, both merging companies stop existing with their previous names and start off with, as a new combined entity under a new brand. Then we have the forward merger and triangular merger. Forward merger is basically a straightforward merger 
in which the target company becomes part of the uh, acquiring company and it ceases to exist as an independent entity. Triangular merger is when there is a third party known as the subsidiary of the buyer. The target company becomes part of the subsidiary company. Then we also have the uh, reverse triangular merger in which the subsidiary company becomes part of the target company. So it means the target company is large enough to acquire the subsidiary. Now this new entity continues as new subsidiary under the parent buyer. So the acquirer is the one at the top followed by the, uh, the target company uh, which, is, which has subsumed the subsidiary of the original acquiring company. Then we have the market versus product extension merger. If the emphasis is on expanding the marketplace, this is actually going to happen between companies which have similar products but they've got different markets. So they want to engage with each other to reach out to each other's markets, for instance, across different countries or different regions. Then companies also sometimes come together once they have similar products and similar markets. So it means now this is basically a product extension merger where the product portfolio or product diversification is something that these two companies which are merging or being acquired or acquiring are going to agree upon. Then we have the concept of joint venture or a JV. Joint venture is basically a partnership which is temporal based upon some project. So it means these two companies are going to come together uh, formally or informally uh, uh, for a certain project execution time. The formal joint venture is actually once the entities agree to have another name during the project execution for joint venture in which both of these are going to contribute their assets and share the equity. Then we have the um, deals that is asset deal or stock deal. Asset deal is when the acquiring company purchases the assets of the target company. This could include knowledge, the list of customers, inventory, uh, resources, equipment, uh, paraphernalia, etc. The target company, however, remains the legal owner. So it means this is the asset deal. But the stock deal is once the uh, acquiring company or the buyer purchases the target company's stocks and assumes the ownerships, including both the assets as well as the liabilities. So it means uh, asset um, deal is just the acquisition of the resources um, temporarily, kind of lease, but in stock deal it is the permanent transfer and uh, giving up of the right. Uh, then the two companies could, or more than two companies, could come together for uh, exchanging their shares. It's known as um, stock swap. The target company's shares are exchanged for some of the buyer's shares in a merger or acquisition. Now this has to be quid pro quo or tit for tat. It means some uh, agreeable ratio. Uh, known as swap ratio has to be maintained. Uh, then we have the discounted cash flow in which the acquiring company estimates the potential that the um, target company has to offer through discounted rate. This allows the buyer company to make an intelligent projection about the growth or the monetary worth of the target. Now, uh, the references which I have consulted from are from the smart sheet and a very beautiful paper uh, that has garnered very good citations by Barney Waff, Mergers and Acquisitions in the Telecom Industry, uh, dating back to 2003.